recording the event. So my name is Luke Whitington. I'm the executive officer of the Search Foundation. I'm the host of this event. Um, before we begin, please be aware that this briefing is being recorded so we can post it later to the Search Foundation YouTube channel and I'll post a link to the YouTube channel in the chat section. I'd like to begin by acknowledging, as we always do, that we're meeting here in Australia on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. Sovereignty of this land was never ceded. This land was taken without consent, without treaty and without compensation. Pay my respects to elders and leaders past, present and emerging of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, traditional owners and First Nations all across the continent. I'm on Gundungurra and Darug land where we say Warami Gamarada, welcome comrades. We're very lucky to have Fiona Reynolds with us here tonight and we'll hear from her in just a moment. But first I'll tell everyone about the event and then give a 30 second intro to search and then a one minute introduction to Fiona. Fiona will then speak for around 25 minutes and after that we'll have questions which I invite you to submit in writing in the Q&A section or in the chat. Uh, the chat is open for everybody, <clears throat> please use responsibly. And then we'll wrap up on the hour. We're trying to keep these things short and sweet. Um, of course, to enable us to run it efficiently, everyone's muted unless you're called upon to ask a question. Uh, after you've asked your question, please mute yourself again. When you submit your question in writing, please let me know if you're happy to ask the question yourself or if you want me to ask it on your behalf. Um, as I said, the chat section is open, so uh, please use it responsibly. But you can also ask questions in the Q&A section. So a quick introduction to SEARCH for anyone who doesn't know about us. Uh, SEARCH is a membership-based democratic socialist organisation that links and enables socialist activists across political parties, different generations, different movements, environment movement, workers' rights, women's movement, uh, so on and so forth, all around Australia. And aims to lift the horizons of the left to look beyond the immediate term, beyond the next election and beyond our own shores. Uh, we have members from diverse backgrounds and interests, including Fiona, uh, but we have common aims and values summarised in our goal of democratic ecological socialism. We run socialist education programs, mostly for our young members. We publish news and views on Facebook and at search.org.au and on Twitter. And we put on events like this one. I encourage you to like the Search Facebook page, follow our Twitter page and go to search.org.au if you're interested in volunteering with Search or applying for membership or simply get in touch with me uh, any way you like to uh, talk about what SEARCH does. Our contact details are on the website. You can find me very easily. Now to introduce our guest for tonight, Fiona Reynolds. Fiona Reynolds is a CEO and Managing Director. On the website it says one, of, you just referred to yourself as CEO. So no, I'm CEO, yeah. Very good. Of the Principles of Re uh, Responsible Investment, responsible to the board of for the PRI's global operations which includes more than 1,350 signatories representing over 45 trillion in assets under management across 50 countries. Fiona has more than 20 years experience in the pension sector, working in particular with the Australian government and has played a key role in advocating pension policy change on behalf of working Australians. She has a particular interest in re retirement incomes for women. Uh, prior to joining PRI, Fiona spent seven years as the CEO at the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees uh, an Association for Australian Asset Owners. She's been formerly a Director of Ausfund, the Industry Funds Credit Control uh, Australia for UNHCR and the network, National Network of Women in Super. In September 2012, she was named by the Australian Financial Review as one of Australia's top 100 women of influence for her work in public policy. She also serves on the councils of international integrated reporting. Um, she's recently been to COP26, the COP26 conference, and tonight's event will discuss uh, what happened, what it achieved, what it didn't, uh, some of perhaps Fiona's role and what we might learn from its successes and failures. So thank you very much for being with us Fiona and over to you. Thanks, thanks everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. So maybe I'll tell you a little bit about for some context about what I do and how we come to be at COP26, a little bit about the organisation that I work for. So I work for the Principles for Responsible Investment. So the PRI came out of the UN system and it was created out of the UN about how did you really translate some of the things they were doing into the private sector. So how did you bring about sustainability issues into capital markets? So the, our aim of the organisation when it was established was to get very large institutional investors, so mainly large pension funds and their fund managers around the world, superannuation funds, etc., 
to start to consider environmental, social and governance factors in the way that they invested, because otherwise it was all about my job is just to make money. Well, your job is to make money, make money for our retirement, for example, but it's not to do that in a way that exploits the planet and doesn't understand that there aren't planetary boundaries, or it's not your role to invest money and make money in a way that exploits people. So that's the role that we have been um, playing over the last 16 years since the organisation was formed. I think some of the numbers that um, were a little bit out of date. So we now have today 4,300 signatories from you know, 50 countries around the world, and they represent in US dollars, 140 trillion in assets under management. So that's over half of the world's institutionally managed money. Um, now, I wish I could say that every one of those dollars, those $140 trillion was as invested in a, in a way that considers these factors. I think that would be misleading because many uh, many investors get started with with these issues and they're still they're still working through things. But I think there has been a big change in the private sector in the way that they think about climate issues. And for me, coming to work in the finance sector, because sometimes some people might think that's what has the what's the finance sector got to do with all of these issues? I really think, from my perspective, to bring about change, that you need to follow the money because it's the money that can bring about change. And it is the investors who are shareholders of all of the major fossil fuel companies, of you know, all the major companies in the world are mainly owned by big institutional investors. So we need them to use the levers that they've got as investors to bring about change within the world and also to support um, government in terms of saying to government, that we as big investors in your country expect you to be doing things about issues such as climate change. So um, at COP26, I'll, I'll look, I'll start with some of the headlines and I'm sure that you are familiar with some of them. So I was in Paris for the signing of the Paris Agreement in 2015, which was you know, a fantastic achievement and I will always remember being there at, um, at that time. And at that stage, we were on track for a world of global heating to reach somewhere above 3.4 degrees, depending on which sort of modelling you listen to, it could have been up to six degrees, but sort of 3.4 to four was more about where people thought that we were. Pre-COP then in Glasgow, so getting into 2021, we were at 2.7 degrees. Then post-COP, with, um, with the modelling that has now come out, if all of the commitments have been were made, then we're saying that we are um, at 2.4 degrees. But if, if all of those pledges that were made, we could keep the world to somewhere around two, maybe just under two degrees. But 1.5 is of course where we need to go. And I do believe that after COP in Glasgow, that 1.5 degrees is still alive, but I do have to say that it's got a very, very weak pulse. We've lowered the risk of ca catastrophic climate change, but we really haven't bent the curve anywhere near enough. So what really happen, needs to happen now is we have to have, this is supposed to be the year, the decade of action on climate change with both the private sector and the public sector. So we really need to see increased acceleration. You know, it's 2021, we're early in the decade, but we have to see increased acceleration. And we need to see countries that haven't made significant 2030 commitments, and that includes Australia, that they really need to be pressured to lift their game and to come back next year to COP with upgraded commitments. So what happens within the Paris Agreement is the Paris Agreement that was signed when that was signed, it um, has a five year ratchet in it. So every five years, you are supposed to increase your contributions. And obviously a lot is changing in the world. So a lot can change in five years. So you come back. 
So as we're going forward, the plan was that in 2023, there's a, that there is a global stock take. So where are we at in 2023? And then for 2025, countries are supposed to again come back with increased commitments. But what came out of this COP was we can't really wait just for 2023. We need countries like Australia coming back in 2022, next year, with um, with lots with much better contributions. One of the things that I think it's important to understand about COP is that while yes, there's a final meeting that takes place over two weeks and it brings together again the public sector, private sector, NGOs, unions, activists, um, the civil society. It is also the culmination of a lot of work that's happened over 12 months and really when we come to COP the announcements, um, a lot of those announcements are made and then governments come together and you know form agreements. So I'm a realist. I always go into these meetings thinking, what's what's what would I like? There's there's what I would like to happen, and then there's what's realistically going to happen. And bringing 200 countries together to make an agreement isn't easy. They're all sovereign nations. There's no global police force, unfortunately. There's nothing that's that can force them to do this except you know the pressure of their citizens um, the pressure from other countries the pressure again from the private sector and from ngos so we all play a really important role i think in addition it's important to say we've never had to decarbonize the world before and we've never had to decarbonize the economy so it's difficult and um, you know we shouldn't pretend that it's easy so given where we've got. I think that I wouldn't say that progress hasn't been made. I think that good progress was made, but I'd also say that it's far from being good enough and it's not where we should we should be. So I would probably categorise some of the headlines that they really centred around cash, coal and a willingness to step up on deforestation. So looking at some of the key things that came out of the COP, Deforestation was one of the major things. A major deal was reached that, that covers 85% of global forests. And the commitments to halt and reverse deforestation globally by 2030, and it was one of the first and most important announcements at the conference. So the countries involved in the pledge are home to 85% of the world's forest, and the declara declaration on forests was backed by 14 billion of public and private money that will mainly go to protect the Amazon, the tropical forests of Indonesia, but also the Congo Basin. And this is significant as around a quarter of global emissions come from changes in land use. So reversing trends on historic loss of forest cover coverage and really shifting to reforestation is one of the key large scale options for negative emissions, as well as being really essential to uh, get to net zero and to the transition. So it was significant, as I think there was also another, um, an understanding that from countries around the world, that to be able to make sure that we reach net zero, that that's not just about an energy transition, that that alone is not going to get us to net, net zero. So I was really pleased with the announcements that were made. From the investor side and the side that we work on, that I work on, we had a group of investors, a group of our members who also came together before COP, but the, they made the announcement of COP to be deforestation free by 2025. And to put that in some context, they, these investors that I'm talking about control 10 trillion in assets under management US dollars. So that sends a powerful signal. So it means within their portfolios, within the investments that they make, that they will not um, invest through companies or, or through products that are involved in any way in deforestation. It takes a while to unwind everything from your portfolio. It takes a while to understand and map exactly where 
you are linked to deforestation as well, which is why the commitment is 2025. Just a note of caution here, while I'm saying this is significant, and, and it is, um, commitments have been made before by the um, public sector and by the private sector on forests. There was a big commitment made in 2014. And while work was done, it was not delivered on in full. So we really need action over rhetoric. Then of course, there was um, a pledges made around methane. So the Global Methane Pledge constitutes, I think, another major announcement with 100 countries emitting, uh, committing to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. And um, this was good, but on the negative side, China didn't sign and it's not binding. So for many, of course, when it comes to, cop to COPs every year, fossil fuels are at the forefront of the debate. So there was a series of announcements that were made regarding fossil fuel financing. So more than 40 countries have now committed to ending overseas investment in coal. And this includes major coal using countries such as Poland, Vietnam, Chile. Though, while again, this was a really um, significant event, the biggest coal dependent countries like Australia, like India, like China and the US didn't sign up to the pledge. So good, but again, not good enough. The Glasgow Climate Pact, which details the agreement reached by the parties, however, now includes a line on coal for the first time. So again, that's significant. It's pretty, um, in some ways, it's pretty astonishing that we had a Paris Agreement that actually doesn't mention coal or anything about it. So at least now, in the latest um, agreements, there is this in, there is this discussion and intervention around coal. Although at the last minute, of course, there was interventions from India that watered down adopting the a language from phasing down instead of phasing out. And from down to out, there is a big difference. So now we're phasing down coal produced without the use of technology to capture the emitted carbon or unabated um, coal. And of course, when people talk about this unabated coal and carbon capture of storage, it is a bit, you know, people keep looking at technologies and great if can, technology can be developed. But where we are today, there isn't really unabated coal. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a nonsense. Nevertheless, this did send a strong message to domestic policymakers and to the market on coal. So I do still believe that within the investment market, it will, um, this commitment will mean that we'll have deeper acceleration of coal phase out in the coming years. So while both of these, uh, while all of these key announcements on fossil fuel, I think they do set the chat, the chat, they do set uh, the opportunity for far reaching change, but we still need to go much further and much faster. And the coal phase out agreement was uh, important just to note that it's 2030 for developed countries and 2040 for developing countries. But again, it's not binding. So we've been as an organisation and as an investment community calling on G20 members to set a clear timeline for the comprehensive and equitable phase out of fossil fuel subsidies by 2022. And this includes subsidies for exploration and production and public financing, because what is still surprising to me is that many countries, us as taxpayers, actually subsidise fossil fuel through, through huge subsidies around the world. On the flip side, the phasing out of fossil fuels and subsidies, I think, should lead, if we can get this phase out happening quicker, to the replacement of fossil fuels with renewable energy solutions and the electrification of existing services, including transport and build buildings. And this has to happen if we're going to keep the 1.5 degrees alive. But just to put this in, con in context, the latest analysis that's come out from Transition Zero, one of the organisations that we work with, shows that to be able to do this in terms of the coal sector, that that means the world must close 
3,000 coal units by 2030 to be able to hit 1.5 degrees. So to put that in perspective, that is like, that is closing down basically a coal plant every day. That's huge just to show how much we still need to do around the world. At COP, the other thing that I think was significant was one of the things that we focus on, and we focus on a lot with unions around the world, but particularly with the ITUC, is the issue of the just transition. Just, just transition. So feeling very strongly that workers and communities who are in fossil fuel dependent areas shouldn't be left behind and shouldn't be the people who ultimately pay the price for climate change. And so there was a lot of discussion, a lot more discussion than I've ever heard before, both within the private sector and within the public sector and from governments about a just transition. And then there was a big, there was a big agreement was, that was made in South Africa with, um, with uh, uh, countries committing to give money to South Africa as, as well about some of their transition that was good to see. And from the private sector point of view, from an investor perspective, when we deal with companies, uh, in the beginning when investors were looking at the issue of climate change, all of the discussion was about phasing out fossil fuels. There wasn't enough thought given to the fact that this transition had to include people and communities, but that now is part of the uh, part of the discussion and really good to see. And then the other thing that I was talking about was cash. And there wasn't an appropriate commitment that was made for financial systems for developing countries, for those who didn't cause the problem of all of the emissions that are out there in the atmosphere. So, and no agreement was reached for loss or damage. I actually think, and I know others think as well, that this is really going to bring about litigation risk to other countries around the world unless a funding agreement is reached. They're the ones that are suffering, but they didn't cause the problem and we're not coughing up the money to help them adapt to climate change and to bring about the, ne the necessary change. So all of this has been very welcome and the things that happened at COP are much needed. But, you know, there's very few things that um, are actually enforceable. And so that means that we, as the public sector, private sector, as citizens need to keep on with, with governments. So as I said, even if all of the nationally determined contributions, which are the NDCs, which are what governments need to, co to contribute every, every five years, even if they're fully implemented, as I said earlier, we still have a significant gap between 1.5 degrees we're probably at around, we're probably with all of the commitments made around 2.4 degrees. So the number of pledges and the catchiness of their names won't take us far. It's really about real action and accountability are what truly matters for global warming. I just say also that COP is really about geopolitics. And in many, in many ways, what matters most is what happens between the major countries in the world. So what um, happens between China, the US and Europe. So it was really good to see the agreement between US, the US and China. So they'll fight like cats and dogs on everything, but they have agree, agreed to come together and work on uh, climate change. And I think that's significant. President Xi obviously wasn't at the conference, um, but China did update its its end, its NDC, but it left its commitment to peak emissions before 2030 unchanged, which was a bit disappointing. A bit disappointing from the Chinese government. Um, in September, President Xi pledged to um, end overseas financing for coal pipe coal-fired power plants. Again, this was really important and welcome, but they haven't made commitments about their own domestic use. And there's still a lot of coal use in China, although there is significant uh, ramping up of renewables as well in China. So I think that the US and China had been caught up in a lot of, uh, a lot of finger pointing during the first week of COP, but then came together with the US declaration in the second week. President Biden, of course, um, you know, rejoined 
the Paris Agreement for the US, which was significant, and he's made efforts to rejoin the High Ambition Coalition uh, with the goal of achieving no more than 1.5 degrees of warming. But as we know, he's really got a lot of opposition and, and objections from Senator Joe Manchin, and that you know some of his own people have halted progress on America's momentum towards reaching its climate goal. I'll just just quickly I'll end on Australia, but I'll just say, of course, that there was major announcements made by India, but their commitment to net zero was by twenty uh, was by twenty seventy. So it was it was good to see that they made something, but twenty seven twenty seventy is just too long a time frame for realization of the one point five degrees. On Australia, it was named colossal fossil of COP twenty six. So what happens at uh, every COP that is held is a, a country a, or a company or an organisation is named fossil of the day, every day of the two weeks. And then at the end, someone is named the colossal fossil. So you have, you've got the worst performance and, you know, Australia bared that honour. So we should all be very proud. As Australia, of course, made its long awaited 2050 by net zero uh, commitment, but the details remain elusive. There isn't a current, in the current plan, which is just shocking to me, we still are saying that after 2050, we will be exporting coal and gas. So this is, a, of course, will significantly under, under, undermine global ambition on 1.5. Um, climate policy is increasingly being bedded in, in global trade and economic relations. So I just don't see how Australia thinks it can continue to, to do this. And delays in action, pinning emissions reductions on post, on post 30, on costly new technologies that, and continued reliance on coal and gas really only reinforce investor concerns about longer term structural risks in Australia across its economy. So overall, our expectation um, uh, is that, um, you know, countries like Australia are going to increase their cost of capital, which is bad for citizens, and that we're going to lose investment in Australia because international investors just are looking and saying, there's too much risk in investing in Australia. They're not making the commitments that, that we want. Uh, so to us, countries need to follow science-based evidence in their policy making, and Australia isn't doing that. When we look at the commitments that we make as investors, we make them based on science, and I don't think enough countries are, are, are doing that. I think just wrapping up that some of the major concerns from my perspective about Australia are the opportunities that, that are being lost. So you can't change the Australian economy overnight. You have to plan this over decades. And we should have started a decade ago. Well, in actual fact, we did, but we, we all know what happened. So we need to be thinking about what's going to power our economy for the future. And we need to set the right policy directions to let investment flow. So for example, we have a conservative government in the UK. I don't agree with many things that they do, but I work really well with them on climate. They've got a strong commitment to climate change. They've set out um, dates that are very clear to the market and to citizens about what's happening. So there's a date to fight to phase out the internal combustion engine. We all know that date. There's a coal phase out date. There's dates for how we will retrofit existing buildings. There's dates coming in for changing in the way buildings are built in the future so that they're more energy efficient that they're all more um, environmentally friendly. We're working on land use packages. How do we change the way that farmers farm? How do we change agricultural policies? All of these things are, um, all of these things are in place. So as I said, uh, just wrapping up, you know, I think COP, COP26, I wouldn't say that it was a disaster. I do think progress was made, but it's an incomplete victory. We're not where we need to be and a lot more basically needs needs to, you know, really needs uh, to happen if we're going to get to 1.5 degrees. So maybe I'll um, leave it there because I've talked a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just making sure that I can 
<coughs> reappear. I can see you. Oh, you can see me? Okay, no worries. I think I might be um uh, for the depending on the <clears throat> our, our viewers at home, as it were, for our recordings. We're getting lots of great questions coming through. Thank you, everyone, for those. Um, I do try to um, put them to our guests, myself, part, so they don't have to read them while they're giving the presentation, but also for the benefit of our people who watch these videos today. So um, you'll appreciate why I read them out to people. Um, yeah. So uh, Vivian asks, uh, Vivian Langford, what progress is being made to phase out the fossil fuel subsidies? Um, who are the leaders and how far is Australia from contemplating this in your view? Um, I don't think that Australia is anywhere near contemplating this. Certainly from the investment community. So as I said, I represent investors who, who, um, who control $140 trillion in investment. And the two key things that the investment community around the world ask governments to do for them to be able to invest properly is to put a price on put a price on carbon and end fossil fuel subsidies and it's just um it's not happening in australia it's not happening in many countries so uh, you know uh, investors work in a market-based system and a carbon price some sort of carbon price is a market system and it's a market me mechanism that can um uh, mean that you make the polluters pay it like it makes logical sense but it's just it's not happening there is a lot happening in europe around um, carbon pricing and they are looking at the at, they're looking at subsidies as well so i would really say that europe is really the leading light around climate issues and um, these issues and i think australia will probably kid itself if it doesn't think that it will it, if it thinks that it won't end up paying some sort of carbon price because Europe's bringing in these border adjustments. So if you're trying to import goods into Europe and you're not doing enough on climate that to suit the European Union, then you will be charged uh, an adjustment price. So the cost of goods coming in and out of Europe, Europe for Australia will be much more expensive. And that's, gonna, that's going to be to the detriment of citizens and presumably um the us wouldn't be too far behind uh potentially yeah, the the us is also working on um on uh carbon pricing as well so i i did some work recently with where i think that we will get somewhere on carbon pricing in the next um well, I don't. I hope it doesn't take as long as a decade. Decade. So uh, I've been doing work over the last very long period. Took too long to do with the OECD on um, the whole issue of tax fairness and trying to get uh, trying to get one minimum tax rate for countries around the world. That has now happened, but that took a very long time to happen. So. Now they're, they are moving on and they've just started discussions with the public and the private sector. And now that they've done that, they've made those arrangements, the next thing is bringing the OECD countries together to work on a global agreement around carbon pricing. And I probably think the OECD will be a better organisation. Uh, again, I think it's taken more than two decades to get the work done on, on tax. So I hope that we accelerate that, and that's what they're intending to do. And I do feel I do feel hopeful about that. What do you, uh, Peter Murphy asks? Uh, do you agree with the claim by Scott Morrison that Australia has delivered its 2020 uh, Kyoto commitment and will achieve its 2030 Paris commitment and beat it? Well, maybe it will, but it do doesn't mean that it's good enough, and it's not as it's not as good as other countries. And as we all know, it's being done with, you know, carryover credits. So Australia needed to go to, you know, if you look at other countries that are like countries, they went to um, they they went to Glasgow talking about 45 and 50 percent emissions reductions. So we we were we're well below where we should be. So of course we should meet, and we should beat. If we don't, that will be terrible. But that's just nowhere near good enough. Thank you. I think there's a lot of everyone on the, on the Zoom agrees with that. Um, Helen Hewitt asks, uh, what mechanisms have been developed for countries to report 
regularly against their targets. And uh, something I think we're all interested in is how do people develop campaigns to name and shame the laggards? Yeah, <laughs> well, um, what we try to well, what we try to do in the private sector as investors is we try to work with companies uh, to bring about change. So, for example, we have an initiative that's called Climate Action 100 Plus. So it has 500 invest, big investors in the world with 50, who represent 50 trillion in assets under management. And we have an we have an engagement with the 100 largest emitting companies across the world. So a lot of them are in the energy sector, not all in the energy sector, some are in aviation, et cetera, shipping, those sorts of things. And what we have done is say as investors that we need you to um, first of all, commit to net zero, show us a transition plan, disclose that transition plan. We need to see progress. So we, we, you know, we don't just want you to tell us that you're committed to net zero by 2050. We want to know what the 2025 targets are. Commit to those and we've developed a benchmark so that they have to report against it. And we have things like the Just Transition In, so they have to tell us what they're doing and they need a very detailed plan. So I think the key is that all organisations who make, whether you're a country or a company or an investor or anybody else, when you make a commitment, you have to um, have a detailed climate action plan. Well, that's what we call them, a climate action plan. And then you must report on them on an annual basis. So also within our members, we have a group of asset owners who've committed to net zero by 20. 50, but they have 2025 targets and they that they've just released and they report annually so that you can see the progress. Are they actually making bringing about the change that they said that they would? And I think I think they're the kinds of things that we have to have. Thank you. Um, and I think countries must do that. They must report annually about where, like, not every five years, annually. Where are you at? Produce a report for citizens. Tell us, tell us where, where, where we're at against the, against the targets. One of the debates that's come up um, in Australia, obviously from the National Party and from others, is about nuclear energy. So uh, Jackie mm. Whitten, our Vice President, asks, uh, was there any discussion about nuclear energy? It appears that France is going to remove restrictions on developing new reactors or nuclear parks, as they're called there. Um, what came out of the conference around that? Yes, yeah, so um, there was a lot of discussion about nuclear energy. Obviously, for some of the countries like France, they get a lot of their uh, they get a lot of their energy that they you know obviously consider to be um, carbon carbon friendly, like nuclear energy, and they're not keen really to get rid of nuclear energy. It does become a bit of a sticking point with France when it comes down to getting into regulation. So, for example, we've been working with the EU on developing what's called a taxonomy. So it's like if you're investing and you have to invest in um, clean sources, then what's the list of them and how, what are they and what are the categorizations? So it's, it's just, you know, something like that, but to keep it simple. And France is, because uh, this all has to go through the EU Commission, and France is insisting that within this list of clean, of clean technologies and clean um, energy that nuclear is there, but of course other countries feel very strongly the other way. Now, there's no doubt that there is much better technology that is around today for small nuclear uh, power, but, it's, but there isn't, and that, that's true and no one can deny that, but there is no better way to store nuclear waste. And we all know what's happened from things like Chernobyl, Fukushima, etc. So, so while I completely understand the debate about nuclear being a more environmentally friendly fuel, it's not going to be if there's a nuclear disaster. So I, I just don't support that that's what we should be doing. I just think we have to be scaling up the renewables and other technologies. And that's what France needs to be doing. But it does really dig its heel, heels in on, on nuclear. A problem multiplier rather than a problem 
solver, as my friends in the renewable energy sector call it, nuclear. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jim Crosthwaite asks, um, you've discussed fossil fuels, specifically coal. Um, you did mention gas, I think, after he, he asked this question, but he said, can you talk about gas as the elephant in the room? It was there much debate outside the NGOs on rapidly phasing out methane. Do any big investment funds propose exiting gas ASAP or are almost all likely to continue to support gas infrastructure? Uh, are you hopeful that this will change quickly? Yeah, yeah. So I, I still think that gas will be supported for a little while from the investment community, but they do understand it. They do completely understand that it is a transition fuel and they're not going to keep investing in it forever. It's just part of the transition until there is enough other, other energy sources. They're busy investing in, in new solutions. Um, and yeah, so they are absolutely understand that it has a short life. And they're also, so they're working with gas, with energy companies around what is this, how are we going to supply energy and what are the sources and how do we transition those sources? Uh, but they're absolutely, the, most of the investors I work with anyway, they're absolutely not investing in new exploration. And you, or new, or new infrastructure. So, you know, you find in a lot of these things that are, and this is a problem for Australia, is that um, the banks are not lending on these kinds of projects. The insurers won't insure them and the investors won't invest in them. And that's going to continue to be the trend from, ma from the major players in the, in the finance sector. Thank you. Um, question yes, go, so sorry. gas was sorry i can see gas so yes gas was discussed at um at, at cop 26 not not probably as much as it should have been but it what but it was discussed and a lot of it was around what i was just talking about about further that there shouldn't be further exploration etc i will also note that there was a lot of lobbyists from the um fossil fuel sector at cop 26 one of the things that i've always said and asked is that they should be banned from be, being allowed to be there if they're not making commitments to bring about change they shouldn't be allowed to be there in the background lobbying um countries and other groups if only were so that would be wonderful yeah. <laughs> we should ban them from the halls of parliament here too uh, yeah exactly <laughs> uh related to that question is a great question uh, that is a question from dave bell um other than comforting rhetoric, uh, you know, can we believe that our greedy capitalists are going to make the cuts uh, to fossil fuels that are necessary by 2030? You know, can we uh, really believe that uh, people with their um, interests of profits at stake are going to actually make these cuts that are necessary? I suppose, sorry, yeah, well, I'll, I'll just fold that in with a question which uh, Vivian, um, uh, sorry, which, um, uh, Rose Reid asked, which was about since we're getting close to time, uh, she mentioned that you know COP doesn't have the power of compulsion. Uh, UNPRI doesn't either. Yeah. How can we make organisations um, act seriously on the you know on their commitments, and what do you think will make them step up locally and globally? Yeah. Um, well, I do think that citizens have to pay, play a huge role in uh, demanding change, and I know that in Australia people do, but we need more and um, we need more of them and really really voting on climate you know because you might agree with it you might agree with the government on other things but climate has to start becoming the number one issue at the top of people's minds when they vote uh, so while we yes on the on from our perspective yes the pri can't make him we're not responsible in terms of Investors have their own boards and make their decisions about investments. We give guidance about what they what they should be doing. We do make them report every year and be transparent about what they're doing, though, so that people can see what they're doing. And we we make companies be transparent about what they're doing as well. And investors are increasingly not wanting to invest in countries or companies that don't have very significant transition plans. I think at the end of the day, the the role of the private sector has now 
overtaken the role of governments in many countries and that is going to be a lot of the pro it's going to be a lot of this is going to be met by the private sector not by the public sector i do worry when we're talking about um, australia and scott morrison he's just pushing everything down onto the private sector though and that's it has to be a cooperation between governments need to set out the right policies so that investment can flow. It can't just be, oh look, new technologies are going to be um, uh, are going to be done and investments going to flow into the country and all of those sorts of things. Uh, I cannot tell you how much, and I, I get frustrated because I don't see this reported in the news in Australia that much. Although I don't, you know, read the Australian news every day, but when I'm there. I can't tell you how much that Australia is so badly thought of around the world, badly thought of in the in every all the climate talks I've ever ever been to, was really badly thought of in um, at COP26. Probably the worst this was, even though this was the actual year we made this 2050 commitment. People, you know, countries and government around the world just saw through it for what it was. Uh, uh, no one wanted to be around any of the any of the Australians, um, for, or the Australian government, I should say, and negotiating team. Australia was there trying to water things down with India, with China, in the back, you know, in the back rooms, didn't agree to things. So, um, and that that flows on to invest investors as well, and. Um, investors see look at some of the things happening in Australia, Australia on climate on Indigenous issues, really horrified, and on, and on things that, on refugee issues, really horrified and just, you know, um, I, I went to something just recently where uh, uh, investor, major investors in the world were talking about Australia being a sovereign risk. So, you know, you rate when you're making an in investments around the world, you think about risk and one of them is sovereign risk, but you normally think about sovereign risks in sort of, you know, war-torn countries or places, or, you know, where there's a lot of corruption and things in Africa. That's what you're normally thinking about, about sovereign risk. You don't really think about countries like Australia, but now because we've, of the way the government behaves, investors are starting to see us as a sovereign risk and we're not gonna get the capital flowing. The debate about you know whether the private sector will be able to lead this or the government um as you say is um, probably the answer is both but there's a, a good question from here from um darren mcdonald who asks um about the role of governments particularly about the role of china so the role of china is commonly denigrated in the west um how do you mark china's plans and action and is the future really dependent essentially on what china and the us does well, I, I do think that in a large way that um, that China and the US are the important players. They're the major emitters and they're the, the major economies and that's not going to change probably between now and 2050. So um, they so I, 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 we cannot underestimate how much how important they are because also where they go, others will then others then follow a little bit more. I do work. I um do work with the Chinese government. So I actually think China gets a bit of a bad rap and that China's doing quite a lot. So I've been involved, I am involved with China on um, the Belt and Road projects. And it's about if we're, if, look, you can, you can disagree with the Belt and Road or all, all of those sort of things from a geopolitical point of view, whatever your view is. But the fact is it's happening. So how do, my thing is how do we make it green? And that's what we've been working on. And that, you know, they're doing a lot. They're also scaling up renewables far more than other countries. But, you know, let, let's be realistic about the challenges that China has. It's still bringing many, many people out of poverty. And it's still, you know, in some parts of China, not all parts, it's still, they're still developing. And, um, you know, as many people say, they, they haven't had the they haven't been able to, uh, they haven't made the emissions based on the fact that um, of all of the years of polluting the world, we, we have. So uh, no, I, I think China gets a bad rap and I think they're doing, that they're doing a lot. Could they do more? Yes. But they're doing, I would say they're actually doing more than most. 
for the scales of the problems that they've got, for the size of their population. Um, you know, yeah, they're doing a lot. They're changing um, regulations in their banking sector, in their investment sector. Uh, they're making things more transparent. Oh, yeah. um, you mentioned obviously the, the idea that we're kind of heading for 2.4. Um, there's a chance of 1.5 still being alive, still having a pulse, as you, as you put it. Um, Sam Altman, uh, super search member on this issue, always uh, uh, pushing it uh, and, and educating people about it, points out that even 1.5, uh, it could be disastrous. There's, uh, you know, tropics becoming uninhabitable, uh, up to a million species becoming extinct, unsurvivable heat. Uh, corals 90% dead, water scarcity, global food insecurity, fire, permafrost thaw, thaw, and the risk of climate um, feedback loops. Um, he also mentions, you know, large increase in climate refugees from uh, Middle East, North Africa, Sub-Sahara. Um, do you see, you know, a, a global response to those uh, major issues, even at 1.6%? So um, 1.5, yes, when I talk about 1.5 and that this is what the world needs to keep global heating to, um, there's a lot of, already there's a lot of climate change that's already baked into the system. And that's not going to be, that's not going to be reversed. It's just, we need to stop it from getting worse and, and worse. So uh, I, yeah, so people, I don't think people should think if we keep to get up to 1.5 degrees, that means climate change is going to go away because we've just done or we've already done irre irreversible um, damage and we're not going to be able to repair some of that damage um, at all. And what was the rest? Sorry, can you just tell me the question again? My mind's gone blank. Uh I think he was asking, you know, is there going to be a global response to to limit those, you know, major impacts, of, um, uh, including? Uh, oh yeah, we're talking about climate refugees. refugees. Yeah, uh, yeah. I have well, climate refugees is all, that's already happening, and a lot of the there were, you know, a lot of the um, Pacific Island nations were at COP26, and they made very impassioned pleas. Some of their countries are simply not going to survive, and that's, you know, uh, and somehow they, this just, just doesn't get taken into consideration uh, enough at all. And we will, we're already having climate refugees. That's happened and is happening, and it's going to continue to happen. I really worry about that issue because look at how terribly in Australia we treat refugees as it is. So what are we going to do when we have more Pacific Island refugees are, because of climate? How are we going to treat these people when again, they didn't create the problem we did? Um, so, yeah. So I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a terrible, it's a terrible issue. And a lot more needs to be done. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a, there's a couple of uh, things that we mentioned. I can see that someone that Dave thinks that if we if um <laughs> if, if that doesn't believe that uh, capitalism is going to going to save. Well, uh, um, I can understand where you're coming from, but like I said, I think if you're going to bring about change in the world, you've got to you've got to follow the money and look at look at some of the governments that we've got in the world. We can't trust them to bring about change. So the private sector's got to step up and play their role. I come at this from the point of view is if I'm a long-term investor, like a super fund, I'm investing money for 50, 60, 70 years. I'm not investing it for, you know, I'm not a day trader. Governments come and go, but in the, in the the over the time I'm invested across the economy and climate change is a risk. And making investors understand that I, I still think is, it's not the only part of the um, solution, Dave. I'm not pretending it is, but it is an important part of bringing about um, of bringing about change, changing the way the, what people will invest in it, in, in, ha in uh, um, and how. Might have time for the last minute. Just to um, Pat had a question about the whole idea of carbon capture and storage, you know, being so dear to Morrison's heart, um, mm. and I think they're still. You know, trying to uh, get private money into that. Um, 
you know, what's the global verdict on that? And then we'll, I think we'll finish up. Yeah. So, um, look, look, it, will technology be part of the solution to climate change? Yes. Can, can we sit around waiting for the technologies to be developed before we get on with things and say that's the solution? No, because we don't know what, what technologies will work and, what, and won't. And there's been no carbon capture of storage things at, ma at major scale or anything like that that have yet been created that, that work. So I think he, you know, we should, we should still be, in, we should be investing in climate solutions. We should be looking at different solutions, but we can't just make that our plan and we can't sit around waiting for, waiting for things that might never happen to happen. Well said. Comrade, this has been incredibly informative and helpful. Um, I think you mentioned at the start when we were having a bit of a chat that uh, you don't always watch the Australian politics because um, some of it can be it's a too bit depressing. depressing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think for some of us who are on the Zoom tonight, we um, uh, didn't watch too much of the COP26 proceedings because it was too depressing. Too depressing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So having you come and uh, give us the perspective as a set fellow search member who's you know right there on the spot um, and then being able to hopefully uh, uh, get lots of people to watch this on our YouTube channel and so forth has been absolutely fantastic. The breadth of what you've talked about uh, and you know the rapid fire questions, I don't think we've answered as many questions in a, a session as, as this one. Um, it's just been fantastic. So thank you so much. I'll give you the final word before we wrap up. Anything you want to say to the comrades? Well, um, thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, like like I said, you might not all ag agree with me. This, these are just my p perspectives working in the working in the private sector about about what happened. I would like I also would like to see governments do a lot more and lead the way. I just don't believe that a lot of them will, and we need we all need to do more. Thank you. And I'm coming back. I'm coming back to Australia to live, and I hope to give the I hope to be able to see the you know see changes in uh, Australia and seeing changes in government, government policy, but I won't be holding my breath. But I will work, be working to doing my part to bring them about. Well, that's brilliant. That's a perfect segue into saying our next search <laughs> uh, event is on, or thing that we're doing is on Monday when we're calling uh, parliamentarians about uh, supporting the voice of parliament. And on Tuesday, we're having our federal election working group. You can sign up for both of those things at the search website to be part of those actions and the working groups there involved. And uh, I did mention that well, at the beginning, before most people came on, that um, just saw Sally McManus up in at the Springwood pub. Uh, she'll be speaking at our AGM. So everyone come along to the AGM on the 28th, of, Sunday, the 28th of November. Thank you so much, Fiona. And thank you to all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Stay all safe there. and well, everyone. Bye. Take care.